You're listening to the Balanced Educator Podcast, episode number 125. Welcome to the Balanced Educator. We're your hosts, Kaylee and Josiane from EduCalm. Our intention is to equip and empower you to feel more calm, balanced, and joyful in all aspects of your life. Hello there and welcome. We are so happy to have you here with us today. For those of you that have been listening to the show for a while now, welcome back. It is such a joy to spend this time with you. And we really want to thank you so much for sharing about the show with your friends or colleagues that you think would get value from it too. Our numbers are growing. We have more and more people listening to the podcast and more and more people using the education classroom program to use social emotional learning and mindfulness to create a calm and focused learning atmosphere. So thank you for sharing about EduCalm because this just means that we are able to impact more teachers, impact more students, and bring more calm and joy, hopefully, into the lives of both teachers and students and their families. So thank you for sharing. For those of you that are new here, um, thank you for being here. We're so excited that you're joining this community and we hope that we can serve you and support you in whatever your goals are this school year and moving forward for both yourself personally and professionally. So this is great. All right. Now, in this episode, we are going to be talking about bringing more fun into the classroom. So if you have students in the classroom displaying problem behaviors, having more fun might be your solution. In this episode, we've invited behavior specialist Dr. Marcy Bagel onto the show to teach us how having more fun in the classroom, whether that's in person or online, can help students manage their behavior. For over 20 years, Dr. Marcy, our guest, has helped families and educators help kids with challenging behaviors. From the preschooler who won't sit still, to the tween who's defiant and disrespectful, to the teen who has ODD and ADHD, her realistic, action-based approach has resulted in less tantrums, less disruption, and less fighting. Dr. Marcy earned her doctorate from Teachers College at Columbia University. She's the best-selling author of Love Your Family Again and and love your classroom again. She's based in New York City, where she connects with teachers on her Facebook group, Behavior and Beyond, What School Didn't Teach You, and with parents through her membership program, Parents Doing It All. For more information about her programs and professional development trainings, visit drmarcy.com. Now, before we dive into this awesome interview, we are so happy to share a new sponsor with you, Pockets Change. Pockets Change is building financial resilience through hip-hop pedagogy. If you aren't sure what that means, you have to listen to our episode 120 called Teaching Financial Wellbeing, where we interviewed one of the founders of Pockets Change, Andrea Ferrero, and she taught us that financial education is more than just numbers. It's actually a tool for self-care and social justice. Pockets Change provides workshops, curriculum, and professional development where students, parents, and educators develop an understanding of their personal relationship with money, and they learn new ways of thinking and talking about money. They develop the skills to take action and advocate for themselves and others. I've used their curriculum resources in my classroom, and I just loved how their lessons made talking and teaching about money feel really easy and kind of removed that stigma and awkwardness that kind of comes around talking about money. So the first activity I did with my students was called Find Your Money Personality, and I got it for free from the Pockets Change website. You can try it too and sign up for the Pockets Change monthly newsletter at Pockets Change change.com forward slash personality. And we'll link to that in our show notes as well. So that's pocketschange.com forward slash personality. All right, let's get into this interview. Hello there, Dr. Marcy. Thank you so much for coming on the show with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I am delighted to be here. We were so drawn to your energy and also the way that you teach. So we're really excited to share you with our audience today. Before we get started, can we just start off with who is Dr. Marcy and how did life lead you to where you are today? 
What a great question. And of course, so I am a behavior specialist, which means that I have spent over 20 years trying to understand how behavior works and how it moves so that I can help kids which mostly means their parents and their teachers understand what's going on so that we can have the most fabulous experience together because kids learn when they're understood and behavior is just a communication challenge. So that's been what I've been doing. And I think really I landed here because as a kid, I had learning challenges and I had teachers that didn't understand me and really wanted to make sure that people understood this piece that somehow seems like a mystery, but shouldn't be. And if teachers were trained in how behavior worked, their classrooms would be so much different. So that's my mission, is to help the adults understand what what and why the kids are doing what they're doing. I love that. I feel like as teachers, we aren't necessarily trained in university that much about behavior. It really becomes something that we have to kind of learn in the field. Um, and usually that's on a case by case basis. You know, you get a behavior that looks like this, and then it's this puzzle of how to you know, support that child so that we can curb that behavior and kind of bring out the best in them. So I love that you're on this mission to sort of teach it beforehand (laughs) and help teachers sort of make quicker progress forward. So one of the things that I am excited about that you like to talk about is how more fun can be the solution to behavior problems. So let's dive into that. Tell me, how did you figure this out, that more fun is the solution? (laughs) Well, I mean, it really is, and we never think about that. But the truth is, behavior is a communication. So when kids need something, They act out because they don't know how to communicate it in any other way. It's not that they're a bad kid because there are no bad kids. It's not because they hate you because they don't really know you. They just don't know how else to get your attention or how else to get out of doing something that's too hard for them or how else to get to the bathroom because they really have to go. Like They just don't know how to do it. So I realized that rather than punishing kids for bad behavior, we needed to teach them to do it differently which means not only just teaching them, you get my attention by raising your hand as opposed to hitting the kid next to you, but it also means that you get my attention because you're doing an amazing job and I'm just going to do a little happy dance for you. You get my attention because you've listened to me and now I'm going to sit on the floor and play with you. And the more I did that, the faster behavior change happened because it's about the relationship because we're dealing with humans, big humans, little humans, humans of all sizes. But if we remember that, then we get to think about, well, what would make me happy? I don't want to hang around with somebody who's superior to me and yells at me all the time. I want to hang out with someone who compliments me, who teaches me how to do it better, and who has fun with me. So the more fun we have, the more our kids are willing to problem solve and figure it out and be on the same team with us. Yeah. So can you give me an example of how we could put this into action in a classroom. So let's let's kind of imagine here that we are in an elementary school classroom and that there's a student that is showing behaviors that are kind of taking our attention away from the rest of the class because it's a very um an outward behavior let's say. And as you said, just, you know, punishing them isn't fixing the problem. So what could be steps that I as a teacher take to teach that child that, okay, acting out, hitting the neighbor, um, yelling really loudly in inappropriate times isn't the best way to get my attention? How do we start building that relationship and teaching them a better way? Yeah. So the great thing about behavior is that it comes in patterns, right? The kiddo who, you know, shoves the child in the desk next to them imagining that you're in school in person and that they can touch the child next to them, right? Like, let's assume that for a moment. The kiddo who does that does that every single day for a week, a month, and a row. So you know it's happening, which means you can make a plan in advance. So rather than just being frustrated and correcting it once it happens, at the start of whatever that lesson is going to be, go, okay, I know that my kiddo Sam 
It's going to have a hard time. I know it. So what can I do to make him successful? Ah, I'm going to make him my helper. I'm going to tell him that he needs to make sure that everyone else's eyes are on their paper. Or I'm going to ask him to go sharpen his pencil three times in the middle of class. Or I'm going to ask him to stand in the back of the room, then stand in the front of the room, then stand in the back of the room. Because he's always wiggling around and he's got to move. So I'm going to come up with what he can do that's a little fun, a little playful, a little different while I'm doing my lesson so that everyone can learn what they need to learn. But it also means that I'm talking to him every three to four minutes, which I would be doing anyway in a correction. But this way it's positive. And at the end of it, when everybody else starts doing their work, I'm going to go over to him. I'm going to give him a high five and a sticker, tell him he's a rock star and to get down to work. So it's that proactive enjoyment that you are starting to build in the relationship. But that forethought means that you just went through a lesson congratulating a kid rather than correcting him. Now, let's just be clear. That was a really easy, simple example. And when you put it in place, it does not run as smoothly. But after a few times of putting it in place, it will be that smooth. So we're looking at building that relationship, giving clear sort of actions that that child can take to have more success and then giving that positive reinforcement afterwards so that they're getting their te- the attention that they're seeking from us, but in a positive way. And we're showing them that, okay, this is kind of the new routine that we're going to create this positive reinforcement, this positive interaction and isn't a positive interaction so much more fun than a negative interaction, right? For everybody. Part of what is so exhausting at the end of the day as a teacher is that you've just spent the day saying no and putting out fires and telling them to stop and managing everything instead of building skills. And this allows you to build skills. And as you said so beautifully in that recap, they were looking for your attention. They were getting it one way or another. So give it for doing good things. Give it for listening. Give it for being on the same page with you. And so often teachers will say, well, I don't have time to do that. I just, there are too many other things happening. But if you stop and take a good look at what you're really doing, you'll see that you are already spending that energy tenfold. I'm just giving you a redirection of it. Yeah, exactly. So now let's kind of put this into a high school context. Mm -hmm. How could this relationship building and making things fun look in a high school context? It's probably going to be more context-based for a high school student, right? Giving them some like fun things to be like, you're doing great. They would walk out of your classroom. (laughs) But asking them, right? They're just, (laughs) nope, not going to do it. They're too cool for school. So Having them do work that's related to something that they care about, that they're interested in, as opposed to just what you're interested in, bringing in things of their life that matter to them. Because so many high schoolers that are disconnected or withdrawn or are having behavior problems just don't have any adults that care about them, don't believe in themselves either. So if you become the teacher who not in a cheesy, over-the-top way that I am with five-year-olds... But in a, I see you as a human and you can do anything you want, genuinely and truly. If you let them know that you believe in them, they will go to the moon for you. Yeah, definitely. So as we're talking about behaviors, one thing that I've kind of learned through my own experience in the classroom is that a lot of the times the things that we do to support students that have obvious outward behavior. Um, I don't want to say problems, but they're behaving in ways that are unacceptable in class or not conducive to learning in the classroom. Um, A lot of those things that we would put into place for the students that are obviously acting in that way can actually be really beneficial if we're doing those same things with everyone. So when we're talking about creating connections and creating relationships with these kids that have challenging behaviors, because that is a symptom of them needing, requiring just a little more love. You know, I I like to think of my, whenever I see a student that is showing challenging behaviors, I'm just thinking to myself, they need more love. They need more love. Mm -hmm. They need more love. (laughs) How can I love on them more so that they feel 
what they're what they're seeking, which is more love and attention. So if we're doing that for one student in the classroom, every student is going to benefit from that. So could you share some strategies on how to promote this sort of treatment of all students um, in an elementary school classroom? Yes. So there are so many ways to do it. And I love this question. And I love the framing of the attention seeking kid just needing more love, right? We always think of it as like, I can't believe how much more attention do they need? No, they just need love and connection. And when we flip that perspective, then it becomes so much easier to be like, oh, well, I can fill up your bucket and make that feel good for them. So when you have to do it with the whole class, because it's not just one-on-one, which my practice sometimes is, but you need to think of exercises that it's not just you sharing love, but everyone in the classroom. So I have this, I have two different thoughts. One is I do this exercise called I am amazing in which, and I do it when I do professional development training, I have all of the teachers in the room stand up and do it. And it is amazing. But doing it with your kids is also phenomenal. Will you stand up and you take a superhero pose? So you put your feet wide, your hands on your hips, and you stand up tall and you hold that pose for two minutes And you repeat over and over and over again, I am amazing. I am amazing. I am amazing. I am amazing. And so everyone in the classroom is doing it, right? You do it to model for them. And sometimes initially it's a call and response because kids are like, "What what are we doing? What's happening? But after you say, I am amazing. I am amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. For two minutes in that pose, you feel amazing. And so it's teaching your kids to fill themselves up and to do it in community where it's not bad to say that you're amazing. You celebrate that you feel good about yourself. So that's the first one. Know what that what's making me what's coming up for me here is we um, have a social emotional learning and mindfulness program for classrooms. And one of the units that we have in there is self-confidence. And we had Mm. lots of teachers asking us to add this unit to the program because especially in middle school years, um, high school years, but really across all age levels, as teachers, you see a lot of how a lack of confidence, self-confidence and self-worth Um, translates into students feeling that, well, I can't learn and so I won't even try. So in this unit, we um, have positive I am statements. And one of the practices is to talk about and to say, I'm perfect exactly as I am. Now, one year when I was teaching grade six, it was so interesting. I played the audio from the program. We listened through it. And after, as soon as the students heard that they were supposed to rep- repeat the statement, I am perfect exactly as I am, they freaked out. They were like, but no one's perfect. You know, n- no one can be perfect. Right. And it was such an interesting discussion and an interesting thing to see how they felt that no matter how hard they tried, no one could be perfect. And then reframing that um, to what if we're already perfect exactly as we are and we do things not to try to be perfect, but just because it's fun. <laughs> you yes. know, what if we learn because like a challenge is fun, not because we're trying to be perfect. Um, so like doing an exercise like I am amazing, I can totally imagine students, especially I teach high school this year, Um, grade 10, I can totally see them feeling really awkward at first and like not wanting to say I am amazing. But how awesome will that be after the two minutes when they finally joined in? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Exactly. And all all that you just shared reminded me of kind of we have this big conversation in our culture around everyone getting a trophy and not everyone should get a trophy or maybe everyone should get a trophy. And there's this back and forth about it. And to me, this exercise or the I am perfect just the way I am is that idea that, yeah, everyone should get a trophy, not because everybody won, not because everyone's the best, but because everyone is amazing. And we need more reminders that whether I made a goal or not, I'm amazing. Whether I, you know, hit the home run and won the game or not, I'm still amazing. And there are so many ways that we as humans forget that right now. Yeah. That I think this exercise helps the teachers just as much as it helps the kids. 
Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. As teachers, especially this year in COVID mm-hmm. times, you know, we are all constantly second guessing ourselves. We, yeah. there's no precedence for this. So whatever we're trying, it's a constant, did I do enough? Am I, am I doing it well right. enough? Am I doing it the right way? And I know for myself who generally, it's not really in my personality to like judge myself a lot. This year I've been dealing with a lot of negative self-talk or not, not necessarily negative self-talk, but just not feeling like I'm doing enough or I'm always kind of Mm re-evaluating everything I'm doing and overthinking it a lot. Um, So yeah, I think teachers could definitely benefit from I am amazing. You know what? The listeners need to do this. Let's actually do it together right now. Should we just do it? I'm in. I'm (laughs) totally in. My hands are on my hips. I am ready for this. Okay. (laughs) Um, let me pull up a timer. Awesome. We need to do it all. Let's do it. it, For those of you that are, if you're driving in your car, just sit up nice and straight with a tall spine. You don't have to have your hands on your hips. Keep your hands on the steering wheel. (laughs) For those of you that are listening in your kitchen while you're cooking, just pause and stand with your feet firmly on the ground, hands on hips. Um, whatever you're doing, just tall spine, feeling confident, wide in the chest. Let's do this. (laughs) All right, ready? And yep. start. I, I am amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I'm 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 amazing. I am amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm amazing. amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm amazing. Amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. <laughs> I am amazing. I'm amazing. I am I'm amazing. amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I'm amazing. <laughs> I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I am amazing. I am you are amazing. amazing. You're amazing too. <laughs> I am amazing. I am amazing. I am amazing. We are amazing. I'm... We are amazing. We are. We're amazing. <laughs> We We're are amazing. amazing. I am amazing. You are amazing. We are amazing. Yes. <laughs> I am amazing. I'm amazing. I am amazing. I am amazing. I'm 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 amazing. You're amazing. You're amazing. We're amazing. We are amazing. We are amazing. We are amazing. (laughs) We did it. Uh, That was fun. Right? That just got my energy flowing. I hope that listeners, you were doing this along with us or at least listening to us and feeling the amazing vibes. (laughs) Yes, I agree. So that felt fun and then also challenging and then fun again and then kind of challenging. And it felt really short, but also really long. That was a very interesting exercise. I liked that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I love how it changes. Yes. Right. I don't know that I've ever done a we are amazing, but I've also never been on a one on one call doing it. (laughs) So um, it's. It's really fun. And, and you hit a point where you're like, isn't this has been five minutes? Like, this is not what, why are we still doing this? What is going on? No, that was only two minutes. And the like sparkliness that I always feel after doing that is powerful. Yeah. I love the idea of starting class that way. That yeah would be so fun. Yeah. So, okay. In class, in the classroom, infusing fun into the day is going to 
help to curve those behaviors. I love the idea of starting class with something fun like this mm-hmm. exercise. Um, I could see myself doing this in an elementary school classroom and for sure in a high school classroom as well. Um, any other suggestions of how to infuse more fun into the classroom? Yes. So, um, the other version of, of this kind of exercise for me where you're building people up and having your students realize how, how great they are is an adaptation of an exercise that I call I love you because that I do with families. But I think sometimes it's a little weird to have your students say I love you because to each other. So if you are in a school where that feels good, go for it. Otherwise, I usually do a you are great because. And having all of the kids go around, and I usually do it in a circle so that you say it to the person to the left of you or to the right of you, but this way no one gets left out and no one gets called on last. We go in a particular order and it's, they have to say a reason why the person next to them is great or amazing or fantastic. Whatever word you choose that feels like your particular culture, use it. But it is this beautiful exercise of it forces you to come up with good in anyone, in everyone, which can be a challenge, but is always there. It also teaches kids to accept and receive a compliment with grace because so many of us, we get a compliment. We're like, oh yeah, okay, whatever. Anyway, no, but to actually say, oh, thank you. And the things that kids will come up with for each other are phenomenal. And so there's no wrong and there's no right. And it can be because I like your hair. Like, you're great because you have curly hair. Okay. Like, that's valid. Or it could be you're great because yesterday when I was really sad, you came and gave me a hug. Right? Whatever it is, is going to work. But it's fun and it brings depth in and some of that resilience that we all really need. And um, it also... provides a place where our kids really need to be brave and say what they think about each other in this beautiful way of compliments, as opposed to some of the negativity that sometimes goes around. Yeah. I love that. Um, and how good does it feel to hear a compliment during your day? You know, it's Mm -hmm. just, why not give the students time to give each other compliments? And it's so true that we do need to learn how to accept compliments And also to give ourselves compliments. So these two exercises, I think, are so important um, for building our students up to allow them the chance to accept compliments from themselves and both give and receive compliments from others. That's so great. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, many of us are in a version of online learning. So what could be a fun activity that we bring into the online learning space? Mm. So the online learning space has really in some ways created so much opportunity to do different and unique things, right? So I have some friends that are very big improvers and have done all sorts of really interesting things online playing games together. So there are things to do like, you know, when I was a little kid, we used to play Coke and Pepsi where you would put your hand, your head down and your thumbs up and, you know, you would try to see who you would match with. And games of like a guess who kind of game where, you know, people turn their cameras off, but there's one person who knows that they're in things like that, that just builds rapport of who am I thinking of so that we're actually using the camera, using the visual, using the fact that we're not all together. That is really, really helpful. Now, if if you have high schoolers and they don't all want their cameras on at all, then we have to come up with ways of doing that through the chat as long as they're willing to chat. And so asking everyone a question, having them type in an answer, but not hit send until you do it all at once. And then it kind of creates a waterfall of answers. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. So it's like little fun things that if you're, you know, say a math teacher, have everyone type in their answer to the problem, but don't hit, hit enter until everyone has their answers in. And then you hit enter and it cascades. So you can see, oh, they all got the same answer. Or no one got the same answer. What are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> but it allows you some some space to just create some visual things within your content. That's awesome. So I love the idea, in especially kind of during these times, it's so easy to get really serious right now with 
COVID and kind of the challenges that we're all facing, whether that's in classroom learning or online learning. And I know as a teacher myself, I can sometimes get to the point that I'm just, you know, so focused on, okay, we need to get through this unit. We need to, you know, get through the, the material. I love the idea of taking a step back and just thinking of how can I make this more fun? Because mm-hmm. if we're all having fun, our brain is turn on, turned on and, and ready for learning. And if it's too heavy, that could be creating the stress response in our students or in ourselves and really not setting the brain up for optimal learning. So infusing fun is such a great way to get the brain and body ready to learn. Well, and there is, there's a statistic and I can't pull up exactly where it's from right now, but I can get it for you if you want to put it in the content, the comments of it takes you 30 to 40 repetitions of information to learn something when you learn it through play. It takes 300 to 400 repetitions if you learn it static. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like exponentially harder to learn when you're stressed out, when you're overwhelmed, when you're just in that kind of I have to learn mode as opposed to when you're having fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Maybe that's why I remember so much from kindergarten. I remember like all the songs we used to sing. I remember the stations. Like I am not the type of person that has a strong memory. I don't remember many things from my past, but man, (laughs) do I have a lot of memories of kindergarten. It was fun. (laughs) You had such a good time there. Yes. So bring that kindergarten fun into your classroom now so that your kids can be like, oh, yeah. I remember 10th grade math. It was the best time ever, even though there was a pandemic happening. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. This is so great. So now you have um, great resources for teachers. Um, You have a couple books. One of them that is called um, Love Your Classroom Again. I love that. Can you talk a little Mm -hmm. bit about that resource? Because I, from your description that I got on your website, that sounds like something that would be so useful for teachers, especially during these times. Yes. So Love Your Classroom Again was written before the pandemic. So just know that it was for in-person learning the way it used to be. But it is the top 25 behavioral questions that I get asked from teachers. And it is all short and sweet chapters. They're three to five pages, so you can read it in a clip. Um, And it is the scenario, why it's happening, and then the solution. So that you can almost use it like a cookbook of the kid who just won't sit still. Wait, where's that chapter? Let me go grab it. The kid who's always hitting, wait, where's that chapter? Let me go grab it. Or you can read it through and kind of I wove in some of the behavioral concepts and principles so that you can really start to learn and understand behavior when you have time to do that. But until then, you can just pick the chapter you need and put those tools in place right away. That is exactly what teachers need. You know, just short, to the point, no fluff. I love it. That is perfect. Well, thank you so much for sharing your awesome energy and ideas for bringing more fun into the classroom, whether that is in person or online, whatever that looks like. For those listeners that want to learn more from you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you or find out more about you? The best place to find out more about me and get in touch is my website, which is drmarcy.com, D-R-M-A-R-C-I-E.com. But I also have a Facebook group for teachers that's Behavior and Beyond for Teachers, What School's Not Teaching You. And I'm live there every Tuesday night with tips and strategies, mostly for teachers themselves right now, because you guys are doing so much that whatever resources I can provide to help you is really what I'm in for. But I would be delighted to help you in any way I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. We will link all of that in the show notes. Um, so for our listeners that are used to going to educom.com forward slash TBE as in The Balanced Educator, this is episode 125. So it'll be educalm.com forward slash TBE 125. Although on most apps now, you can actually just go right into the description from the app and click on the links from there. So whatever is easier. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcy. Thank you so much. It has been so much fun. All right. What a great interview. I literally wrote down on a sticky note, how can this be more fun? And I put it into my agenda where I'm going to see it 
as I'm planning my week with my students, I'm going to ask myself the question, how can I make this more fun for everything that I plan, whether that be something small that I infuse before the lesson, during the lesson, after the lesson, or the lesson itself? How can we make it more fun? That is my goal moving forward. Now, one way that I've been bringing some fun and movement into the classroom is to start our class with one of our mindful movement videos from the Educom classroom program. If you don't know about it already, the Educom Classroom program is our social emotional learning and mindfulness program that gives you ready to use no prep social emotional learning and mindfulness audios and videos that are five minutes or less that you can use in your classroom with your students in both English and French to prepare everyone for calm and focused learning. It helps students learn to self-regulate, gain strategies for their mental health, and just have a moment of calm and focus before you get into your teaching and your lesson for the day. If you'd like to learn more about Educom Classroom, go to educom.com and you can get the first unit of the program as well as training on how to Use this program in your classroom with success for free by signing up for the free trial. And the free trial never expires, so you have access to this free resource forever. And if you enjoy it and you think, wow, it would be great to have one of these five-minute mindfulness practices for every day of the school year so I never have to plan, I never have to do any prep, I know it's ready to go for me, then you can sign up for a full membership, which is a 12-month membership that will give you unlimited access to all the resources in the program. So again, you can find that at educalm.com. That's spelled E-D-U-C-A-L-M-E dot com. All right. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us today. We appreciate you so much. And if you found this episode useful, helpful, please share it with a colleague or a friend that you think would get value from it too. Thank you and have a wonderful week. 